You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get started with this week's episode, a story of a Green Beret who turned his military career into a $100 million business. More on that coming up. But first, our usual reminders. Make sure you guys give us a follow on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But most importantly, make sure you guys hit the Apple Podcast reviews again, please. Uh, We are growing, but we need to get more. And the reviews do not have to be something long and substantial. For example, Cast 576 wrote, Love this podcast. Deeper questions are more thoughtful than the rest. Period. And that's the end of it. Like, that's the whole entire review. Yes, there are some other longer reviews, like 11 ACR Folda says, The Hazard Ground podcasts are very inspiring and great to listen to on long trips. Some of the podcasts I had listened to before, I listened to again. Each time I discover something new or something I had initially missed, I recently drove to Maine and back from Georgia. The Hazard Ground makes those long trips bearable. I highly recommend everyone subscribe to the Hazard Ground podcast. Thank you guys both for the comments, both short and long. But seriously, whatever the review is, it's going to help us out. So please go to Apple Podcasts. You can do it right there on your iPhone and click on the Hazard Ground Podcast at the bottom. There's a rating and a review. Just hit the rating button. Give us five stars. We'll type a short review and you're on your way. So certainly, please, again, hit the Apple Podcast reviews for us. Help us continue to grow. Don't forget also to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us there. And of course, our Amazon promotion on our website, hazardground.com. As always, you go to the bottom of the homepage or click on the sponsors tab, hit that Amazon button, and you'll be directed right to Amazon. You can do all of your normal Amazon shopping, and we'll get a percentage of what you guys spend, and we'll donate a percentage of that back to some of the great charities that you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground. So wishing everybody a wonderful, happy, and healthy week, and on to this week's episode. Joining us on the Hazard Ground this week is a former Army Staff Sergeant who spent five years as a Green Beret. He has multiple deployments around the world, including a tour in Iraq as well. He founded the company called GORUCK, which is a company whose mission statement is simple, inspire, challenge, and equip people to ruck up with friends and embrace the suck. He wrote a book about his experiences in building GORUCK titled How Not to Start a Backpack Company. He graduated from Georgetown Business School. He is also on the board of directors of the Green Beret Foundation. He is Jason McCarthy joining us here on the Hazard Ground. Jason, welcome, brother. Great to have you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, look, uh, this is a, a great story. One we've chased after for a while here on the Hazard Ground. Go Ruck, one of the more popular uh, veteran-owned companies. Everybody seems to know who you guys are. You've built a little bit of a mini empire to your credit, so certainly uh, interested to hear about all that. But uh, you're, you're one of those folks who signed up right after 9-11, correct? After 9-11, because of 9-11, absolutely. What was the sort of background behind that decision? Where were you and sort of what do you remember? Well, I had just graduated from college in May of 2001. And, I, you know, I didn't really know what I... I wanted to do something that mattered, but I really didn't know what that meant. You know, I, I didn't grow up around the military. My grandfather was in Korea, but you never talked about it. You know, that generation, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it was just something where I wanted to do something, something great, but it, it's a really, it's a really humbling and kind of scary and awkward and all sorts of different feelings about that time from when you're about 15 until you know, shoot, 25, 30 sometimes, you're just trying to figure out what's my way in the world. And, you know, I don't think back and say, man, 9-11 was awesome because it was a, a horrific, horrible day, right? A little piece of everyone died that day. Mm-hmm. And yet, for me, it provided absolute moral and clarity in just so many ways. And so it, it, it made it really clear to me that I needed to serve my country. And so I you know, I, I applied all around and went through that game. And then ultimately, I, I enlisted into the 18 X-ray program to try to become a, a Green Beret. So that was in the fall of 2003. What did your dad say when you told him you were going to enlist? Uh, my dad was not the issue. My mom was the issue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, you know, my mom cried at the kitchen counter and said, no, 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 and all that stuff, right? I mean, you know... Uh, I think that it's it's a normal, natural thing that 
in a time of war, when your son comes to you and says he wants to go fight the war, that a, a mom just assumes that you're, you're going to die, right? And at some point, I think, for those of, for those of us who, who are there, we all kind of made our peace in our own way, you know? And you just assume it's going to happen. And, you know, IEDs were the big threat. and You just kind of make your peace with it. Like this, and, and then you're liberated, and then you can go do your job. Right. But I wasn't there yet. I was at the point where my mom was crying on the kitchen, you know, and then like they're trying to talk me out of it. And I'm like, well, no, I already signed the paper. Like we're, we're moving forward with this. And, you know, ultimately everybody really supported me and everyone really got behind, got behind it. And it was, you know, my family's way of kind of supporting our country at that time in a really overt way. What did you know about Green Berets at that point that made you? go for that option immediately? Well, it took me a little bit of time. I mean, I, I actually applied to the CIA for a, a long while. And, you know, that's a really lengthy process. And I kept asking them about their paramilitary side. And eventually this, this guy in a like, Northern Virginia hotel conference room took me aside and was like, hey, we don't really hire directly to, to join the paramilitary side, you got to go join special forces or special operations. And I was like, man, I wish someone would have told me that a year ago, you know, and that just was what it was. So then I'm like, all right, well, I guess I got to go join special forces. So then I, you know, then I went through other, which, what special forces, and you can overthink this stuff, especially when you're a college boy, like I was, you know, you can overthink this stuff until the end of time. And the wars started passing me by. And so at some point I'm like, look, I, I got to make a decision here. I, I apply to be an officer and everyone has this notion that, you know, go to war, go to jail and the military gets the bottom of the barrel and all this stuff, which I found to be completely untrue. I found a, a waiting list to get into the military a mile long. And, you know, I, for whatever reason, I, I wasn't getting in as an officer. And this is now October of 2003. So the invasion of Baghdad's already already complete and I'm just like Afghanistan, Iraq. It just felt like the wars were passing me by and it felt like this really <laughs> stinking feeling in the gut of my stomach. And, and, you know, I, I knew that I would regret it for the rest of my life if I didn't, if I didn't sign that line and say, Hey, send me. Yeah. The, the, the wars are passing you by. Little did we know, right? <laughs> mm. 20 years later, we're still yeah. in Afghanistan. <laughs> Uh, I just chuckle yeah, when I hear that. True story. Well, because true story. we all thought that back then, right? Like everybody who signed up to go to war, like, hey, I want to fight for my country. You know, they attacked us. I want to fight. We better hurry up and go because, you know, we're going to miss this whole thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say there was for special forces. You're right. I mean, I, I it's a long time uh, to, to be in, in these places. But as far as basically at that time, everybody in special forces was fighting the war. Yes. And now it, it is certainly a lot more restrictive. I mean, you've got guys that become green berets. They're not going straight to war. They're doing other stuff or they're doing, you know, and I'm sure it's the same across a lot of, of other branches. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm not here, I'm not some warmonger. I'm, you know, it's funny when you, when you go, when you go there and you do that, it, it pushes you the opposite, Right. It's like, I got to prove stuff to myself and the people around me. And I want to be a good dad and I want to be a good husband and, and stuff like that. But I, I don't, I don't need to like, beat my chest at all. Like you just, you, you gain humility and I gained a lot of humility and, you know, I'm glad that I got to go and, and do that though. Right. It would have been a, it would have been an incomplete experience had I not deployed to war. Yes, uh, I concur. Uh, pause on these sort of chronological events here. Just you're curious your thoughts when you talk about Green Berets right now who, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a completely different skill set, right? And prior to the War on Terror, we knew Green Berets existed, but they did not have the public persona that they do now. Uh, and, and you've been out for over a decade now, but just kind of your thoughts on the way Green Berets Special Operations is profiled now, how it's such a common understanding by the average citizen and uh, the, the way Green Berets have had to transform what they do into more commonplace missions, if you will. I mean, does it bother you at all? I mean, do you have any, any sort of feelings on, you know, what uh, being a Green Beret has become these days? 
I mean, first off, it's it's one of the great honors of my life to to associate with with the regiment. I mean, it it, it really changes you as a person because you you see and you feel what right looks like, mm-hmm. and it's not something that nobody in my generation was a self made man. No team was a self made team, right? We we stood on the shoulders of those who came before us, and it really is a, a generational thing. So. The the last really su- significant and sustained fighting was in Vietnam by the Green Berets, specifically Fifth Special Forces Group, and and um, y- you know that led to well, sorry, let me back back up to that, which was the classic mission there was working by, with, and through Indigenous forces inside of Vietnam, right? right. Foreign Again, internal defense, the, as they call it. Uh, yeah. So uh, against. The, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, all, all, all these things, right? And so that mission set became exceptionally valuable immediately after 9-11 because the Green Berets are, are a nimble force. And we're, 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 we're treated as force multipliers, right? So we move into a war zone and we train up indigenous fighters and we fight by, with, and through them. So when the weather was terrible in Afghanistan in the fall of 2001 and they said, hey, we can't have anybody here until spring, you know, POTUS and, and uh, so Bush and Rumsfeld basically kicked it back and said, no, we need boots on the ground now. And so the Green Berets got sent in and the classic mission of the Green Berets came to fruition, right? Which is work by, with, and through the Northern Alliance in this case. And then you, you do that to defeat the Taliban. And for some historical perspective, this was done in the boneyard of the Soviet empire, right? The Afghanistan was not something, I mean, Afghanistan was not a place where they were strangers to fighting or anything like that. Like they, they crippled and they toppled the Soviet empire. And in about two months by working with these local forces and with, with the air force, right? I mean, the United States air force was, is, was, is, and will always be an extraordinary asset on the battlefield. I mean, God bless, God bless those guys, guys and gals. And, and so you had this proof of concept right out of the gates, like look, Look what the Green Berets did, with, with the help of the CIA, by the way. But look what happened here. It's like, okay, Special Forces did it. Well, it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know? You just keep going to your – it's like you keep giving the ball to the guy that's going to score. And, you know, some of that stuff – Green Berets have become kind of a, a catch-all solution, and, and as well as, as Special Operations, right? I mean, because – it's just, we're cut from the same cloth as, as the other, the other special operations services. But I think that as the wars have wound down, the dependency on special forces has stayed exceptionally high. And I, it's, it's probably not sustainable. You know, I mean, it's, it's not a magic pill. There's, it's not a silver bullet. You can't just send Green Berets into every situation or, or, or our counterparts in other special operations. And it, it's just going to get fixed immediately or it's, it's just kind of not how it works, you know? Right. So yeah. this is, it, it's one of those situations where look, if you do some good and you get some praise and they give you more work, that's a good thing. Nobody signed up for less work. So I'm not here to sit and say, don't give us the missions. I'm just here to say, it's time to take a step back and look at what the role uh, the role is, and and fundamentally, I mean, my my take, and this is probably just because this is how I was, I was professionally brought up, is that a a lower signature, more highly trained team is better than just throwing soldiers and and assaulters at a problem, right? Like fewer fewer is is better, especially in the medium and the, in the long run, because we're not out there to, to seize land. We don't want to take over countries. We need to have other broader objectives and special forces need to be at the, at, at the tip of the spear of that. But it, it's not like we don't want to occupy these places. We don't, that's not what we're built for. And so it's, it's one of those, look, we can talk about this until the end of time and go back and forth. But ultimately I'm really proud that I served in special forces I'm, I'm really proud of the guys that taught me and trained me. I'm really proud of the guys I served with. And, uh, and I'm increasingly and exceptionally proud of, of those who are out there doing, doing God's work for our country now. 
Amen. All right. Uh, when you signed up to be a Green Beret, what did you know about it? And I mean, I know you talked about the paramilitary side, but specifically the process because you got to go to assessment and selection and all the other stuff. And so uh, were you prepared for that? Did you read up on it? Did you study it? Or did you kind of just go into it blind? I mean, I came in essentially blind. I, if you would ask me what's the difference between Green Berets and Rangers and Delta and, you know, Recon, I mean, it's, it's just there's so much that's really hard to understand. You know, I, I knew I wanted to be infantry and I wanted to be more infantry, right? And so, you know, I didn't really understand things. I'll give you a, a good example. I had no idea what rucking was before I got to sort of towards the end of basic training. They said, hey, here's all this stuff and here's a rucksack. Put it in there. Follow me. Right. Keep up. You know, you were 430 at Fort Benning. Everyone's <laughs> in, in formation. And it's like it's just a, you know, it's a slinky. It's just up and down the, the whatever the, the hardball there. And <laughs> You know, I, I didn't know what this was. And so then come to find out that rocking is literally all you're going to do in special forces training. I mean, you see this stuff. You watch, so you watch Discovery Channel, right? And mm -hmm. Like, oh, it's log PT. It's a rifle PT. And there's lots of yelling. Like, not the case at all. <laughs> that, that's 0% the case. There's, I mean, there's, there's some bullhorns for, shoot, I mean, I'm going to say one or two days of your entire Q course, there's bullhorns in it. Like, it's just not that kind of a course. I mean, yeah, if you've got 150 dudes out there, you've got to yell to be heard, but not, not because you're angry or screaming at people, right? It's just like, you know, but the, the, the cameras on the Discovery, they, you know, you got one day a log PT and it's built for cameras. And, and so, you know, that's what they cover. I get it. So I was blind, man. I, I didn't know. I, and, and then I was just kind of, hey, deal with it and adapt or die. And I just, I, I just had this horrific, horrific fear of failure, right? Like I do not want to, I do not want to sign up to do this and then end up not doing this job, right? Like I, I just, I do not want to fail this. And that became my supreme motivation. Toughest part of assessment and selection for you. So phase two was, was really tough. So phase two was like our version of, of Ranger school. It's called SUT. Somebody unit tactics. All the state numbers change and stuff all the time, but it's just really slow patrolling. I mean, it's based on Vietnam era tactics. So ambushes and, and I just, I'm kind of built for more speed. Like I enjoyed, I enjoyed special forces ass uh, assessment selection. Um, Hey, here's your rucksack. Go find your point. It was, I mean, I'm 41, almost 42 now. And I would go back to, S, to SFAS, the Special Forces Assessment and Selection. I would go back now if I could, right? It's three weeks. I kind of know what it is. Land nav, you're out there under the stars. I mean, maybe I wouldn't want to go in January, but I, I would. <laughs> like, it's, it's not, it's just not, it's not that bad. Right. It, it's all mental. And once you know how to do it, you're, you're good. Phase two, I would not go back to that. That would not be fun. It just, there was just something about it. And I, I just, I didn't, you had a lot of the, the, the guys in there who had been in the infantry and now we're coming through special forces. And they had a bunch of us with no experience whatsoever, straight off the street. And I just felt overwhelmed to a certain extent, not like, I'm not like biting my fingernails off all day, every day or anything. It just was, I just kind of didn't get it, but it was just hard for me. And so the tactics and you're, you're just drinking out of a fire hose. When you look back at the, you know, teamwork aspect of this whole thing and learning it, because it's such a critical part of becoming a green beret, right? It's you talk about, you know, not wanting to fail. You can fail tasks, but still succeed as a team player and, and, and in teamwork fashion and you have to go back and do it again and pass, obviously, to go through the course. But were you surprised at how team-oriented things were? I expected and, and wanted to be part of something bigger than myself. So that, that element of teamwork and, and all that, I mean, 
I was not surprised, but you just don't know what it's going to be like until you actually go through it. You know, I mean, you're just cold and you're wet and you're tired and you've been out there for weeks and it's just, you will eventually people find out who you are. You can't hide it. And so it's one thing to be on a team for a 45 minute workout and you got fist bumps and rah, rah, and I'll buy you a hundred beers when we're done. And that's great. Right. I mean, and, and I do that stuff and it's great. It's awesome. Right. This is America. You know, we, we should, we need to do that stuff. But what we don't do is go out for a week or two weeks and you're starving and you don't sleep. And it, it's just, you have every, any rational person w- w- is just miserable, right? So you have to be irrational. And that's kind of how it works. And, you know, you find out who can endure that kind of stuff and still be a positive influence on the team. Because if you let your, your head go and you just go to a negative place, it's, it's a cancer. And that's, that's basically one of the things that they're testing or seeing how you do is because there's no substitute for the stress, right? I mean, you're either, so there's, there's a couple crutches or things that you just can't deal with. There's cold food or lack thereof and, and sleep. Those are kind of the big three. And for me, it was, it was always the cold. I didn't care about sleep and I didn't care about food, but man, the cold, like when it's out there and you're just sitting in there in that ambush line and you're just jackhammer shivering because you've been there for hours. You know, it's the rocks are heavy. You set it down, you, you lay into your ambush line and you just sit there and it's just so cold. It's down to the, my very, and it's like, you have to just deal with it. And that's the thing, right? Nobody cares. If you don't, if, if you decide to say, Hey, I can't take this because I'm too cold. Nobody cares. Like that, it's just then don't be here. Just quit them. Yeah. Hey, and it's not they're not rude about it. It's just the it's just part of the deal. It's like you don't get that anywhere else. I mean, where else everyone's coddling everything all the time now. Mm-hmm. Right? And and which to some extent it's okay. Like the customer's always right type stuff. I believe in that stuff. Right? But I also believe in personal responsibility. And I, and I believe that you need to get out and you need to think about something more than yourself. And you need, to, you need to be part of your neighborhood. You need to be part of your community. You need to, you know, you need to put something above just yourself. That's what, that's the foundation and the fabric of America. And, and so out there, it's all about that. Like nobody cares. Like, right? Oh, you've got, you know, well, I'll give you an example. Let's say you you got a little bit of food left, and it's just you and your buddy, and you're out there on on the line, and it's like maybe he already ate his whole everything. He doesn't have anything left, and whatever. And you pull yours out, and you're like, "Oh, hey, I'm just going to eat this because you already ate yours." Like that's a good way to get hated, you know. <laughs> and and so it's it's one of those things where you've got to be a team player, and you've got to do this just as a way of life. And once you learn those lessons, you're just, you're a much better and happier person. Right. You mentioned before that you're going to get found out, like people are going to find out who you are and, and and depravity sort of in general in life exposes, I don't want to say the ugliness of people, but it just sort of gets you down to bare essentials of of what's important to you. And and I'm curious, um, you know, as you're going through this, are you aware of that? I mean, every game Beret you talk to talks in hindsight about it of, you know, knowing that, hey, you know, th- there's a guy that went through your course, the Q course or, or SFAS with you that inevitably showed them, showed their ass, so to speak. And you knew from the jump that this person wasn't going to make it. Were you one of those people who was aware of that while it was going on? Like, hey, uh, I can't let myself go to a place where, uh, you know, I- I'm going to sort of be the worst version of myself in front of others? Yeah, I, I know what you're trying to say. It's hard to put my finger on exactly, but I know exactly what you're... There, there are certain people that this line of work, they're just not cut out for. Right. <laughs> and you can... I mean, you get to the point where... And now, after having been through it and having served a group and and 
through some of the other stuff that I've done, just team building stuff through Go Rug, I, I will almost tell you, I'm really close to being being able to just look someone in the eye for a very short period of time and telling you if they have that gene. I'm not not every gene, not the hey, you know, they're gonna you know call mom on Valentine's Day or call their wife on Valentine's Day or send their mom flowers on their birthday, but but like the gene of they could pass something like this, you can smell it. You can see it in someone's eye. If, if you know, if you know what you're looking for, how to look. And, and so for me, I mean, no, the thing is like, I lived in fear. I lived in fear constantly of, of not meeting the standard and you don't know what the standard is. Standard is winning, right? Do your best at all times. Just do your best. Do what you think is right. Well, nobody's going to tell you. Nobody's going to tell you what's right. You've got to do what you think is right. That's the point. And so it's one of those things where it was, it's really stressful. And I just, I just never was, I never reached a point where, Hey, I almost quit. I never reached a point where it was like, Oh, I'm, I, I, I've had it enough. There were really, really stressful times. And I'm, I probably lost some years off the advice because of them, but I never reached that point where I said, okay, I'm done. Right. And then I was saved by something miraculous. It just never happened. And I, a lot of people, you, you can watch it, right? I mean, you can see it becomes a pressure cooker because you have peers, you have peer evaluations throughout and the cadre uses those against you. So if you start to be the last in, in the class, the cadre says, Hey, there's 13 people on the squadron and you're 12 or you're 13, you're, you're probably not going to make it right. Mm-hmm. You can leave it at that. And it's just a pressure cooker then because you start to sit and say, how do I get better? <laughs> right. How do I do better? And so, you know, then you have to draw on things like, Hey, can I carry more weight? Can I get up earlier? Can I, you just, there's no room for, for, there's no margin of error. You, you have to, you have to just be on top of your stuff and you have to, and man, I, I, I'm probably, it's probably coming off as ramp. It's just, it's just a pressure cooker. And, and when you get there and I just lived in fear and some, some phases I did really well. And in other phases I struggled, I struggled at phase two, you know, phase one, basically pretty straightforward. Like even phase four, Robin Sage had a, had a blast. I mean, it's a mock war an unconventional warfare situation all over the state of North Carolina. Like you're doing raids on downtown little, North Carolina t- towns, you're sleeping in barns, you're, you're, you're linking up with the underground and all this stuff. Like it was a blast. Other, other parts of the training though, were, were miserable. And you know, it, it, what it really came down to for me was the, the reason why I made it through was because I was physically capable and mentally I wouldn't quit. And you know, I, I trained up really, really hard before I joined the army and I stayed on top of my fitness throughout my time in the Q course. And ultimately that will earn you a lot of respect. If you can ca- bottom line, if you can carry more weight, greater distances than the people that you're around and you can do this on day 21 or day 25 when it really sucks, then you're probably going to be just fine. And, and that's kind of what, that's kind of what set me apart in some of my darker moments in the Q course. So you graduate from the Q course and all said in total, this is about, you know, two and a half, three years worth of training that you had to get to, to get, you know, to wear the green beret when it's all said and done. And, you know, earlier you worried about the war passing you by. Were you worried in the three years of training that the war might pass you by? I mean, I was worried, right? I mean, this is the sort of Pat Tillman story that he joined the Rangers instead of the Green Berets because he wanted to get to war sooner. And and God bless him, right? America needs more people like Pat Tillman. Amen. Um, so the, the short answer is Iraq started to get really shitty at that time. Yeah. You know, so... <laughs> I was there. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, yeah, so the surge was what? Oh, 07. It was right when... Yeah, it was oh, right seven oh eight. There. Yeah, yeah. So you know, there was a build up to maybe the surge, but like oh six was horrible. Yeah, oh five you know? and oh six was the was the height of the violence 
in that country. And so the war started, you know, oh three when you're doing victory laps and Saddam statues coming down mm-hmm. and it's like, man, America's invincible and you know, mission accomplished and all this stuff. It's like, oh, I'm missing everything. And Afghanistan was kind of an afterthought. And you know, and then it started to get really bad again. And and I you know, it kind of brings back some just the unease that I felt at the time, because I'm like, man, this is such a shit show. And, and like, you're at the mercy of the army. That's what I signed up for. I signed up to, to go where America needed me to go. And, you know, there's, there's also some humility that you find in that because, you know, Johnny needing every, every special thing for him. And, you know, he's going to get whatever he wants whenever he wants it. And, and all this stuff, like that's not how the military works. You, you are a, you are an asset that will be used by your your the Secretary of Defense and, and President of the United States of America. And you sign up for that, that's that's what you do. And it's it's worth it. No matter what, it's worth it. And and yet anyway, the war started to not be passing us by because yeah. <laughs> Iraq is bad and, and it's just only getting worse. And it just it, it was a it was a bad form of bad, not like oh, we've got clear mission and purpose and we're going to go over and do this great thing like Operation Overlord or something. It just started to get really messy. And IEDs were the big thing. And there's just something. Like the fear of IEDs was not a fun fear. Again, these are the things you have to, you have to wrestle with. You just have to overcome. Yeah. So, you know, by the time I got to 10th Group in, oh, so I got to Fort Carson in Colorado, in 06 and it's like hey we're leaving for Iraq and so that's the deal and that's what we did you didn't have any choice in 10th group right that was predetermined for you well I had passed out of the the German language so I didn't even I didn't go to language school because I I passed out I was already I'd studied a lot of German mm-hmm. um, prior and the way the groups work you, if, if you have certain languages you go to certain groups right. because when, when it's not all about Iraq and Afghanistan, it's a, it's a big world and you have sort of areas that you're responsible for. And so 10th Group's origins were, you know, 10th Group was the first group founded June 19th, 1952. There, there's a plug for the originals. And the reason why it was called 10th Special Forces Group was because it was deception. We wanted the Russians to believe, as we were fighting the, the you know, early stages of the Cold War, to believe that there were more groups than just one. And so, you know, the, that became the, the battle space was Eastern Bloc, Europe, and, and all of Europe. And so, anyway, long story short is German is a language that will get you assigned to 10th group. Right. Yeah. And so that, that's just kind of how it went. Well, and for those civilians listening, each special forces group is assigned to a region of the world. And as Jason just mentioned, you know, learning a foreign language is, is part of being a Green Beret. And uh, whether you're fifth group in, you know, Asia or you are... What is seventh in South America, right? Or is that third? I, I get confused. Seventh South America. Right. Yeah, seventh South America. Mostly, um, so, like if you're Hispanic in right. America, like you speak, you know, Spanish. You're going to third. Like you're going seventh, seventh group. group. I mean, yeah. So uh, that was just for the civilians listening who just give them a little more background on that. All right. So you get to Iraq in 2007. Um, what is your mission? Where are you going? What are you doing? I mean, what do you know at this point in time as you head into deployment? I mean, realize I'm the lowest of the low guy on the totem pole. So, you know, it's like, all right, we're going. Right, it was kind of it. But we went to Basra first, and it, it was it was a difficult time there for for everyone. But the the Brits were pulling out, so that was the first thing in, in Basra, and it was just, you know, it, again, it was just not. It felt like a very defensive posture, and. If you're out there and, and you haven't experienced this kind of thing, it's, it's counterintuitive. But in matters of violence, offense is actually safer. Yes. Right. If you if you take the fight to the enemy, you get to pick the time, the place, the location. You get to do those things. You, you can fall back on your training. That's that's what teams do. That's why you train. Kinetic operations are like that's you're good at those. It's it's when everything is kind of you're on your back heels, it gets really dangerous because you also, the hairs on the back of your neck, they're standing up all the time. Anyway, you know, it was every, every afternoon rocket lob, lobbing time onto our base. And, 
you know, it was just the security posture was was really low. The, the IEDs were coming over from from Iran in, in massive ways. You know, Prince Harry was actually supposed to get stationed down to Bras- Basra right after, uh, right after, right toward the end of our deployment. But the the one of the British officers who had his billet was killed in an IED blast in one of or an ESP rather, I believe, an ESP blast in in the sector. I mean, it was just it was just like not a not a fun time to be there, and and, and I don't mean. From the standpoint of morale was low, it, it wasn't low. Morale was was good. I mean, like our our teams. This is this is why you train and you love the people around you. I just mean the whole operational environment was was kind of weird. And and so uh, anyway, yeah. So that that was where we started, and then I, I got pushed out to to a different different location, and, and I served in in Nazaria, which was kind of just up the just up the road, so to say. Mm-hmm. And, and so I was there for the the remainder of the deployment in, in 07. It's interesting. You talk about, uh, you know, offense being the, you know, the force multiplier, if you will, or, you know, being on the offensive and for civilians, again, listening, I, I'd use this analogy. Uh, if you're going to be in a car accident, you'd rather be the one going faster doing the hitting than the car standing still. Right. The, 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 the advantage is on your side in that case, as far as safety is concerned. So with that in mind, do you get to do offensive operations when you move to Nasiriyah? So the challenge was that it, it was we were in a it was called a pick, a provincial Iraqi council province, a pick province. And what that meant was if, if I messed that up, I got it pretty close. Right. <laughs> um, but basically what that meant was that they had overall operational control over everything in the sector. And so when we first showed up, it was, they were not super interested in, in having us there. Right. I mean, said, Hey, you know, do you have weapons? Hey, do you have, what can you give us? Like give us things, you know, kind of like the rest of the universe. And, and, uh, you know, <laughs> we're like, Oh, we're, we're going to train you and do all this. So we had the, the police force there and it was, it was not until, uh, I mean, Muqtad al Sadr decided to send down a bunch of troops down to the down to the city, and they were overrun and needed our our help. And so then that's when that's when we became really good friends with them. And you know they, they called us in to come rescue them out of the the hotel and um, to to rescue us out of the hotel. Uh, and you know it was it was just like chaos in the streets and and <laughs> yeah that, that was that was my introduction so to say until that point was there a, a moment where you thought you know i signed up in a post 9 11 world to go and fight for my country and i haven't done anything that i thought i was signing up to do like did, did, was there a void to that or did you just kind of get wrapped up in i don't want to phrase it like green Bray lifestyle but you know just be the idea of being a green beret sort of no, met there, that there's measure. A massive, there's a massive void. It's it's like everybody knows. Be, be careful what you wish for, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's like you don't want anything bad to happen, but you want something to test you to happen. Yeah. You, you want something. You want to prove your training. You want to prove what you've been through in some which way. And and so, yeah. I mean, you know, a, a basic, a very basic. Thing. It's like, did you did you get a CIB? Yes or no, right? I mean, were you? What basically means were you in a firefight? Did you get shot at? Yes or no? Did you return fire? Yes or no? And you know that was that was the night I got my CIB, and and it was it was um, you know we were fortunate. We had our our partner force and we had the air force. I mean, I I was a uh, I was in charge of controlling the aircraft, so because I'd been to that school and. And, uh, I mean, they sent us everything. I mean, everything. So we had the, the biggest gunship in, in country uh, above us, the, the whole, the whole duration of that mission. And then we had all sorts of fast movers. So F-16s and, and others, I mean, there was, it's called a stack, right? So if you have a lot of aircraft showing up, you have to mine the stack. 
meaning which aircraft is at which height and ha- what are you having them do. So, you know, I'm, I'm having all the fast movers do aer- aerial reconnaissance and shows of force, you know, all, all over town. And, um, yeah. And then, you know, we're, we're out. It sort of, it went from defense to offense. And so the defense was go recover the bodies at the, at the, at the hospital. The, the offense was where are the bad guys? And, and that was a switch that, that happened that night. And so, you know, because the, the intelligence basically said, Hey, there's a lot of guys coming down here and back to that maximum of, in, in matters of, of violence, offense is safer. If you don't fight them now while they're transitioning, then they're just going to dig in and they're going to get stronger. And so you want you want to deal with it offensively. It, it's kind of like the definition of courage is, is not, not being afraid. It's saddling up anyway. Mm-hmm. And so that, that was our task at night. We, we worked with our partner force. And we, we basically did loops of the town looking for a gunfight. Everywhere we went, we were looking to pick a fight. And I can remember back in the day when I heard something like that before I had done that, and I thought it sounded crazy. (laughs) Why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense, you know? It's like William Wallace in Braveheart when he's like, I'm going to go pick a fight, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly right. And it's like, why would you do that when you could hope for peace or something. And unfortunately that's just not how the world works sometimes. And the situation that we found ourselves in, it was safer and and better for security and better in every which way if we, if we took it to the enemy. So, so that's what we did. After that's over. And again, I, I know you're not focused on, you know, the metal and the CIB or, you know, on your chest or anything like that, but do you get a sense of, this is what I came here to do. I tested my medal. I passed. I, I've sort of fulfilled, for lack of a better term, my own like little personal destiny that I started out. Is there any sense of that? Feeling? Well, the medal. I mean, like I, I there. I mean, the CIB. It's like whatever. I, mean, right. I, I just say that because it's like a, a thing that's official. The only thing that really mattered was the respect of the people I was around. And after that night, they that was they gave me my team shirt when we got back from that mission. That's right. Awesome. Cause up until then I was, I was the new guy and, and like that, that team shirt, I mean, it, at a really deep level, it means more to me than my special forces tab or my green gray, like the actual physical things, you know, like the not my knife or whatever. Right. Like the, the, that, the symbol of that team shirt means more to me than anything else that I, that I did in my time in special forces, because it, it's, it's one thing to earn something in training, but it's another thing to earn it in war. And right. it's one thing to earn it, you know, a, a certain way. And it's another thing when you don't know exactly how to earn it, but then they tell you that you've earned it and that you earned it in war. And so that, that meant a lot to me. Yeah, you're, and, and you're part of the crew up, now. And it always will. Yeah, you're part of the crew now. Yeah, and from that point on, it was like I was absolutely part of the team. I mean, there was no, it, it happens fast. You know, there, there was no division. It was just, I mean, look, I'm still the low guy. It's not like, it's not like I've got all this wealth of experience and everyone wants me to pontificate my opinions on every mission or anything. And that's not the point, right? Uh, you you got to know your place in life. And my place was still to listen, but they, they knew that they could count on me. And that gave me a lot of confidence. I mean, more than anything from my time in, in the military, their confidence, their trust, I should say, trust in me is what, it's like a, an eternal spring of confidence. And yeah. you have to fill it up other ways. But it, it really meant it meant a lot, and you, it, it's something that you can't. It's not for sale, and you can't experience that feeling. If you, you can't experience that feeling unless you earn it, and it, it's it will require risk. There's risk to your mortal existence to earn it. Yeah, and and that's what a lot of people don't 
they're uncomfortable doing that. And so they, they choose a different path and, you know, they, they make peace with that path one way or another. I, I was fortunate enough to have a similar experience in that, you know, again, I'm not a tab guy, but I was fortunate enough to deploy into that realm. And I've told this story several times, but you know, the only way that I realized that I was, uh, you know, recognized by Green Berets as a, as a piece of the team that was valuable is because they kept giving me more work. They trusted me enough to continue to give me more work and give me assignments and ask me to do things and ask me to help them out because they knew I could get the job done. And, and that is something I've taken with me my entire career um, as far as, you know, un- understanding your role. As you talk about, everybody's got to know their role. Um, I-, I wasn't there to to assault on objectives. I was there to be a support function for these guys. But every time they needed something, they came to me. And that was the one way I knew that I was sort of accepted um, as a peer, uh, you know, a military peer in their eyes was that they trusted me enough to keep coming back because I learned very quickly that uh, th- no one was going to tell me that I wasn't useful. They weren't going to tell me that I wasn't doing wrong. They, no, no one was going to stop and hold my hand and go, you know, we really like you to do a little bit more. They just, they just find a different solution if you're in the way. And so the, the way I realized and recognized that I was doing good was that they kept coming back. And, and, and that was, as you said, you can't put a price on that. That's something that I earned and I take with me everywhere. That is 100% how it works, right? I mean, to this day... It's, it's kind of like, it's, it's the same in athletic sport teams, but if, but it's really like this in the team room. If someone ignores you, that's the, that's the worst, right? If they're messing with you all the time, right? I mean, that's like, that's our love language. Like we, you're, you're, you're kind of young and you, you do actually, you just love being on the team. Everyone loves being on the team. And and so you don't know how to express this. Even when you're older, a little bit older, like kind of can't express things certain ways. So what do you do? You just mess with each other, you know, mm-hmm. all the time. Like practical jokes, you know, everything is on limits, everything. And, you know, if someone messes up, you just, you just like rake them over the coals. But if, if someone is distanced from the team for whatever reason it's the Kiss first telltale sign is silence Kiss of death. right mm-hmm. like nobody wants to talk to that person and man before too long that person is, is off the team it's just kind of how it works so if they're feeding you work if, if it's like hey do this do this i need you you need me that's how it works right like you literally in order to survive you need each other this is such a foreign concept in so many ways in, in our, our modern day society, but it feels great. You just have to choose your team wisely. And, and the biggest motivation is not letting anybody down. Like they came to me and asked me to do something. I just didn't want to let them down. I didn't want them to think that I couldn't do anything that they needed to ask me to do. And that was enough motivation every day to try to get up and kick as much ass as possible because I just didn't want, I didn't want them to ever look at me and go, I'll find a different solution. You know, I wanted to be the solution every time. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how it works. Man, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like it, it works way better than money or ribbons or anything like that. Right. Like the, the team can handle the team's business and the team is really good at doing that. All right. So that deployment ends, uh, and you end up, uh, going where next? You know, classic stuff went back to Carson for a bit. And then we were, we did a, a backfill SIF mission. So Commanders and Extremist Force, I think it changed names, but everything changes names. So was, was located, first of the tent was located in Stuttgart, Germany. And so we went there so that they could go to Iraq because they hadn't been yet. And, and then while we were there, we, you know, we trained up, we did some training there and stuff. And then we also did a, a, a J set. I don't even know what that stands for. You basically go to, you know, joint combined something. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, but we went to Mauritania, which is in Western, uh, Western Africa and trained up their, their troops there. And that was one of the, the greatest 
five or six weeks of my life. That was awesome. It was just my team and me in the Islamic Republic of Mauritania. And, you know, we, we trained up their troops for probably 20 hours a week because that was the maximum that they, they wanted. And the rest of the time was ours. So we went to the range and, you know, we explored the country on the weekends a little bit and, you know, worked out and we, we took over a little mini hotel. I mean, it's out in the middle of nowhere, right? Like, I don't know, three something hour drive maybe from the, from the coast. And we just had the, we had the country to ourselves. It, it felt like it was, uh, it was great. It was, it, it felt like a reward after we'd gone to war together. And, and so it was just, everyone was happy to be there and to be alive and, and all of that stuff. Right. And we, we knew we had it good. So it was, it was pretty awesome. Now, after this uh, run in West Africa, you decide to get out, correct? I did. What yeah. was the impetus for that decision? I mean, you, you had sort of lusted after this for so long and you, and you finally got to where you wanted to go and then it's time to move on. Yeah. So my, my wife was in the, the CIA at the time. Um, so she was a case officer and she was posted to a different country in, in West Africa. And we had been married for, I don't know, four years or almost five years and had never lived together. <laughs> and, and so there was just kind of, you know, a, a lot of strain being put on, on that. And this was kind of the, the goal line, so to say. So it was like, you know, I, I was, it, we kind of knew this was the plan for a while. And even though I knew it was the plan, I, it made me really, I was really sad when I, when I left the army, when I drove off of Port Carson, I turned in my, sort of parking sticker, you know, took a razor blade to the sticker on the front of my car that lets me get on base and, and all that stuff and turned it in and drove across the country and then caught a flight to go to West Africa with, you know, basically all my stuff in the back of my truck. And it was just kind of, it, it was not a happy day. And I guess I kind of knew that it wouldn't be a happy day, but you know, it's like, you can't, you can't do two things at the same time. And, and these are just the hard decisions that we have to make. And so, yeah, so I got out and moved to West Africa. Yeah. That, that's not um, Different part of West Africa. I was going to say, but that's not, not a place a lot of people want to move. So why there was it, was it to be with your wife at the time? Yeah, so she was posted there. So, you know, their postings there are, are three years, two or three years or something. So, you know, she had a diplomatic house and, and all that jazz, right? And I was going to be, you know, the her, her sidekick, her spouse. And that was um, – and I was super cool with that, you know? Um, it, it was cool until it wasn't, though, just overall. Like, our, <laughs> it, it turns out you, you need to kind of spend time together in order to – like, relationships don't work if you try to skip to the end five years later. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the relationships <laughs> tend to be a pain in the ass like that. You kind of have to be in them uh, for them to work yeah, out for everybody uh, involved. <laughs> yeah, even in a time of war, you know, God and country stuff. It's just kind of how it works. So you're you're in West Africa. Um, when does the idea for Go Ruck come about? So the idea for Go Ruck was her idea. And Emily's idea. And, you know, I, I built, I was still in the special forces mindset. I built a, a go bag or a go rock for her. And I just put some stuff in it. I put it in her car and I said, Hey, you know, you're driving around because they love a good zoo in Africa. We know this, right? And so, Hey, you've got some stuff in here. If anything happens, this is what's in here. And we went through it. Just, Hey, just, just drive around. You, you've got this now. And had another one for the house, you know, it's, it's just in case something bad happens and here's where your stuff is, you know, what you need to grab if you have to sleep. And I, as I was looking for something to do in West Africa, it was kind of like, all right, well, you can do the go rock thing for a year or whatever. And then we'll go back and live in DC and I'll be at Langley. And then my plan, I'd, I'd go to the farm and, and we'd be in the CIA together or wh whatever that might entail. We still had a lot to figure out. And, we didn't really get to figure any of that stuff out, but that was the, 
that was the plan at, at that time. So I ended, I was only there for three or four months. And then let's see, about three, two or three months, sorry. And, and then I was back home and was sort of going through the, the story of the separation, all that kind of stuff. So then I'm out of, you know, I'm chosen, but I've, um, I, I don't have a job. I don't have a, a life. I don't really know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm kind of starting over and don't have, don't have a lot in my corner at that point. And that's, you know, early 2009. And then through that year, pushing into, yeah, pushing forward. And any sort of regrets or second guessing? I shouldn't have got out. I should have stayed in. I mean, you know, or, you know, do you, do you just realize that, hey, you know, the relationship is more important regardless? I mean, when everything's going bad, everything is, is kind of up for grabs in your own mind, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, I shouldn't have done this. I should have done that. You just sit and second guess everything. It's when you don't have any confidence because you've lost it because some some external force happened. And well, most of the time we make our own bed. Sometimes really bad stuff just happens. But you know, in in our case, you know, we had chosen to do this, right? I mean, she chose to join the CIA. She chose to go deploy to serve our country, and she did so honorably. And and I chose to join the military and I chose to, you know, and, and I wouldn't trade anything like that. I guess my, my point is, is that there's no kind of, sometimes there's just casualties of, of the decisions that we make and it's not meant to be. It's just kind of, this is what happened. And, you know, I don't sit and say, oh, well, it had to, it had to fail or all these things. Like it was so bad to begin with. I don't feel like that way at all. Right. It just kind of, if you, if you take away these support structures, if you take away the things that make someone confident, if you take away the, the things that make relationships work and you just keep taking and taking and taking, eventually everything breaks. I mean, you learn this in fear school, you learn this, like eventually everybody breaks and relationships are no different and people are no different. And so, you know, those, those people on high horses and, and those people that, you know, haven't had anything bad happen to them, but, but have a lot of opinions. Right. I mean, that's, that's kind of not that. Kind of not how the world goes, in, in my opinion, right? Like at some point, everybody finds something really tough, and right. everybody finds something really bad, and then you got to sort of figure out how to deal with it. But if if you sit and and for your whole life feel like you're a victim of what, right? Like, oh well, this shouldn't have happened, or I could have gone back and I could have done this and done that. Sure, like. You know, I could have bought the computer with the video camera so we could have seen each other more often because it was an early technology back then. I was like, yep. yeah. screw this, man. It's like too expensive. It's not going to work. And I'm like, this is we're not going to do that. And so we didn't do it. Like there, there's always stuff like that, you know, and, and the Internet was terrible and all this stuff. And maybe it would have that wasn't the silver bullet that would have saved us is my point. And, and so you can deconstruct the past, but ultimately we, you, we all have to learn how to make peace with really terrible things. Things happen and, and they're, they're not great. And, you know, if, if we're still around, we, we have to make peace with them and we have to, to move forward. So which part of the Green Beret that you were um, comes out the most in these moments where, you know, you talk about, again, I don't know what I'm going to do and, I don't know where I'm going next. I mean, do, do you sort of innately fall back on that individual to figure out how to plan for what's next and what you do? Hmm. Uh, I mean, that was an interesting time. I've never really felt anything quite like that. And before I would become a Green Beret, like the thing is, is you – People think that leadership or confidence is something that you either have or you don't. It's, it's kind of not true, right? Like you're, you're kind of gaining it, gaining it by, by doing hard things and by testing yourself and reinventing yourself and pushing forward and learning and adapting. It's, it's not something that you just kind of 
oh, you know, you just sort of have it or you don't. It's not like riding a bike. There, there are levels of, of this. And so, you know, when, when life got really hard, I mean, the part of me, it was probably, you know, more the part of me that loved my dog and loved my family and loved my grandparents and, and stuff like that, that I leaned on more than the, or that was more effective than the, the, the part of me that's like, Oh, I'll figure out a way to pick my rucksack up and, and do it myself. And, you know, I've, I think every green beret is knows how to do the, Hey, I'll pick up my rucksack and do it myself. What's harder is, is when you have to, you can't do something yourself. And, and I kind of realized that. And it kind of took my dog. The, I was like, man, I just lived for that dog. And he, uh, and he lived for me. And it was one of those things where it was just this symbiotic relationship that we have. And it was, it was great. And it's, it's one of the, the strongest bonds that I've, I've had in my life. And, and so, you know, that, that's what I needed at that time. And, and, um, you know, it, it was, it was very different than when you're, you're in training and it's, you got one hard thing after another and you have to just do it. I mean, that stuff at some point, it becomes kind of easy. And, and I don't say that lightly, right? It, like, or even you, you get to, you're in war and it's, it's like, sure, this mission, that mission, this mission, that mission, you're just kind of doing it. It's the curveballs that are that are by definition curveballs. So, you know, I had to kind of rebuild some of the support structures around me, or how I, my my viewpoint was on on needing support structures, and that was that was um, the green beret in me, not so much. You know, the the definition of the classic definition of green beret, not so much. Although, you know, team and and all that stuff, right? It, you can never divorce that from me. It just, it had to manifest a lot. So how does the actual company, you know, get started from the idea of, you know, your wife at the time when you were in West Africa, how does that, those initial ideas blossom into what is next and what are the sort of initial steps you, you take to start building go Ruck? Yeah. So I, you know, got back to America. I needed something to do, a place to add for a, I like the idea of go rough and, and kind of take the special forces way of life and apply it to other stuff. And so I, I, I placed an ad in, in, and I had some ideas on some, some backpacks or some rucksacks and placed an ad in Craigslist, New York city for a backpack designer and found one that was living out in Montana and it took a couple of years, but then had some functional prototypes. And, and I'm in business school now by the time. So life's kind of, it, it, it's something. It's moving towards the, the right direction, right? Like I have Go Ruck as a hobby. I have a dog that I just love to death. I have, you know, um, I'm, I'm in school. So there's kind of some schedule and some organization. And, and you know, I'm living in D.C. And it's, things are kind of turning around slowly. These things don't happen overnight, right? If someone's selling you a quick fix, like run the other direction because it doesn't exist. You have to kind of build yourself back up slowly. And, and so that's what I was doing. And, and before too long, you know, I had some, I had some rucksacks in my condo and I thought everyone was going to want them. And I'm in business school, so I'm so smart, you know? <laughs> and, well, in fairness, and, uh, you did go to Georgetown nobody, Business School, so let's not undersell that part. I mean, you know, it's a pretty prestigious nobody school. Wanted, nobody wanted to buy them, and, you know, they're just rotting there. So eventually came up with an event called the Go Luck Challenge, which was, you know, based on a team building or team challenge led by a Green Beret. And you would wear your rucksack and do other types of physical training or PT throughout your event. And the first event was like five or six or seven hours. And then they really, they really blossomed from there. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the role that the Green Beret Foundation played in some of this, correct? They were, they were sort of essential and at least 
emotionally getting you the kick in the ass you needed at the time? Yeah, so I made very early friends with with some folks at the at the Green Beret Foundation, and you know, it was just one of those things. I, I reached out to them and I said, "Hey, uh, you know, I, I was a Green Beret. I started this company. We're doing some some cool stuff, and I just would like to be associated with and and a part of the organization, however, which way I can be." And you know, so it was just one of those things where. I just wanted to be still very much a part of the organization that I felt I, I owed so much to. And I wanted to figure out a way to give back. I didn't have anything to give back at that time, like in terms of money, but I had time and I could raise awareness and could talk about the Green Bray Foundation because I was leading a lot of events. And, and so I think it was, you know, it was, it was kind of, it was, it was very mutual because GBF was also a, a young organization. And when you're young in business or nonprofits or whatever, I mean, what you really need is awareness. And, and, and then, you know, the people that you're around, they'll kind of tell you if you're on the right path or not. Like, is this a, a noble cause? Is this a, something that we should support? Yes or no. Like they, they will tell you, they will vote. And, and so it, it, it felt really good to just be a part of that. So we, we raised, we raised some money and we raised some awareness and, you know, more than the money or even the awareness. I mean, it was, it was selfish that I was doing it because I just, I, I needed that part of my life to not die. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I didn't want it to just go away into the oblivion forever. So, um, so it was really important to me and, and the Green Bray, Bray Foundation is a, is a really important organization that I'm, I'm proud to serve on now in a, a little bit different capacity. You also are finishing, as we mentioned, business school at Georgetown. When you graduate, I mean, is it just the idea at this point in time is more go ruck challenges because you're not tied down with school and everything else? Is that sort of the other part of the birthing process of this? I was, yeah. I mean, I was so ready to be out of school at that time. And I felt like Tyler Durden in fight club in, in business <laughs> school. Cause every weekend, man, I was just catching a, a flight to go to some city and then I'd do a recon that would take me, you know, half a day. And then I'd lead the first event and that was 12, 14 hours. Right. And then I'd sleep in a park for two or three hours and, and shove a, a giant sandwich down my throat or something. And I wake up and, and I'd lead another 12 or 14 hour event. And then I'd, you know, catch a bus or, uh, you know, the subway to the airport or whatever. And then I would drool on myself the whole way home. And then I'd go pick up my dog from, you know, my, my friend's house. And they would so graciously, Joe and Tony, if you're listening, I'll always love you. Uh, but they would just shove a bunch of food, homemade food down my throat and Java was there on my dog. And it's like, all right, and tomorrow's Monday. Right. And I'm just done. I mean, you know, you're looking at 50 miles on your feet and, and, and a few hours of, of sleep a night for the weekend. And then, then, then the work week began. And, uh, that was my kind of experience, my second year of business school to, to a big extent. And so, by the way, you know, a lot of that sounds to... as sucky as like, you know, the Q course and assessment and selection, you know, it doesn't sound like it's glorious work. Yeah, but it was awesome, right? It's it's like telling, you know, some of the stories from the Q course, they, they were awesome. I mean, a lot of this, I mean, the actual ability to give back to, to people, we say building better Americans and the ability to give back to Americans on the home front, some of the lessons that I'd learned in war. It, it zero involved pulling triggers, right? This is about a mindset and a way of life. And this was about teaching people what they're made of and doing it in a way that they respond to, right? I'm not a drill sergeant. This isn't boot camp, right? But here's your rucksack and here's some sandbags. Pick them up. Like, let's go. This You can do it, right? And it, it's it, it's really rewarding. And so that that became kind of the drug, you know, I mean, before it was the the team room and, and America's mission. And, and now I had to kind of adapt that and evolve it to being back at, back at home. And, and I'm really grateful that I found 
some people that were willing to come and and do this this fun stuff with me. So uh, help me understand, when do you get out of the, or do you still do the Go Ruck challenges? Uh, if not, like when do you transition from sort of that event-based model to an actual business where you just have inventory and you're selling products, so to speak? Well, it's an interesting business model. And I say that because I haven't seen anything else like it where organically we had an entire events company and an entire product company grow up, not only simultaneously, but symbiotically. And so you know, we had these, these, the rucksacks that we worked on for years to finally build out and get built to scale and, and, and all that stuff. And, and the, the events became kind of the marketing awareness, driving action arm. And it was the energy. In, in the room. And so, you know, it, it was, it was messy. The finances were messy. The process was messy for, for a long time. And eventually what happened was the gear became more scalable. Just people vote with their wallets in the time. Right. And it, it's kind of like, tell me what your, don't tell me what matters to you. Show me what your, bank account and your calendar looks like and and I'll tell you what matters to you. And so people people vote with with actions. And and so, you know, that said, we, we put on like a thousand events the in, in twenty nineteen, right before COVID. And COVID decreased us, but you know, we put on five hundred events last year. Right. And so the point is is that we put on a lot of events. It's it's very right. core to our DNA. But the product is just infinitely more scalable. So as and, and we've just been proving this, right? Like we've been proving this since since day one. Like if you want the best rucksack on the planet, it's it's a go ruck, right? If you want the it's the most proven, it's got the best guarantee, and if you put something in it, it feels the best. It's it's really simple. And we've proven that in the most stressful environments on planet Earth since 2010. And, and so that's the, that's the scalability of the gear side. And the event side is, is just our heart, you know, like you got to feed your heart too. And, and the people lie in the events. We don't just want to ship to you. We, we want to, we want to see you and, and we want to do some work with you. So let's go outside and let's do some awesome stuff. And when we're done, let's drink some beers together and, and let's keep talking about the, the world. So, your stepdad had to invest money into the company just to get more, more rucks, correct? Yeah, that was, he's the, the only other investor in, in go ruck. And that came, that came very early on because I had to buy inventory and I'd spent everything that I, everything I earned in the wars. Right. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. Uh, everything I'd earned in the wars was, was uh, spent. I was, you know, I was in business school at the time. So I, this was, you know, R and D costs and, and all that. And then I had to, had to scale up. So yeah. So he invested, bought some inventory and then got to, got to work kind of figuring out how to sell them. I mean, how much of a lift was that from a business standpoint? Like, do you, do you survive without that, that investment? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm a survivor. So yes. I mean, well, I, I mean does, probably, does go ruck survive? I, I could, I, I could probably make the case that 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 was the worst thing I could have done. Really? Except that he got involved. He got involved. So, you know, and he was a trusted advisor and he's our COO now, by the way. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> like this is, this is worth any, he was on, you know, joined the quote board and, you know, which was, which was me and him talking about things over a case of beer. And, and, uh, you know, I, I guess, there's this fascination. So look, I, I have no regrets. It, it's been, it's been and is an awesome journey with Mike and I'm grateful for his mentorship and his advice. And I was very lucky to have him in my corner and have been for my entire life. The, the thing is that I, I feel like there's this, and I was certainly in the business school mindset, there's kind of, fascination and worship of going out and raising money and, 
and doing all that stuff. And, and that, that's, it's, it's great. It's fine. Right. But there's another way to do it. It's just a little bit slower and it's a little bit more hustle. And so if I would not have taken money, what I would have done was I would have ordered less inventory out of the gates, which by the way, did not sell for a period of time. And I would have not traveled around to 48 States. I would have instead <laughs> stayed at my stayed in my condo and I probably would have figured out more stuff closer to home and I would not have burned through as much cash. And I would not have had, you know, my, my, the other bedroom full of inventory. And I would not have had my buddy's attic full of inventory in, in DC. The point is, is that, you know, cash is like oxygen to a business and, and you have to have it. And, and I say, this is like a guy that I just, I don't wake up thinking about money and I don't go to bed thinking about money. But in the middle of the day, in the middle of the day, every once in a while, I've got to check in on everything that has a number that, that really matters. Because if you don't, if you, if you let that stuff go astray, you're going to go out of business. And I feel like a lot of veterans might struggle with this because you don't, you have to respect what it means to be in business. And if, if you're kind of want to just turn a blind eye to, to the numbers or to the money side, you're going to go out of business. Mm -hmm. Like that's just the thing. The grim reapers coming for you and you have to manage it. You have to manage it closely, not, not razor's edge all the time, but you have to manage it. And, and so if, if you take a bunch of money and you, you get saddled with a bunch of debt, I mean, that has consequences. And I've been, I've been fortunate in that front, but you know, there's other, other other times we've taken small business loans and, and stuff to scale up other inventory. And, you know, eventually you have to pay this stuff back. Like, that's how it works. There's, you have to service your debt. There's interest rates. There's all of these things. And so, you know, everyone, it, it's a very sexy thing to go out and, and get money. It's not that sexy to pay it back. And people don't really write stories about, oh, man, it really sucked to pay it back. Right. No, but listen, it, it, I, I, to your point, I will say this much. As somebody who has used his deployment money to pay off everything that he ever owes, I, I'm the most liquid person in the world. And it, it is an amazing feeling every night. Other than the mortgage on my house, right? I, I don't owe anything to yeah. anybody. I don't have a car loan. I don't got student loans. I, I don't, I, there is no debt to my name anywhere, right? Because the house is equity and, and, and no one needs a business class. But to your point, it is such a relieving feeling to not owe anyone anything in this world, right? Like if you took away everything, I still don't owe anything. And, and hey, I'll, I'll even push it a step further and say, like, I, I'm not the most risk averse person, right? Like I'm, I'm very comfortable. I'm comfortable betting on myself and I'm comfortable with, with a high degree of calculated risk. And, and I will just tell you, like I, I've never lost, I won't say never, I've almost never, I've never in a sustained manner, I, I'm going to get, choose my words carefully, in a sustained manner, lost sleep over money, right? There's been a couple times where we got not a good space and had to make some decisions that were not fun, right? Those are short flashes in time, but I don't go to bed stressed out about this stuff. And, and you know, I guess I'm kind of built to endure through that. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I, I'm just, I'm just going to keep driving on. Like that's just kind of part of the deal. And, and, and yet it's not that great to be saddled with, with debt. Like just, just, I, I say that to say objectively, it's just not that great. And I think that it's, it's especially with, with COVID and the way that things have gone with shocks, the system and, you know, how the stock market's really high and Bitcoin's worth millions of bucks. And, and like, there's just some weird stuff going on. And, and my take in, in out of this is there's more room than ever for really solid brands, right? Brands that can endure shocks because they, they built passionate followings or they built communities or they built something like that. And, and I think that there's more emphasis on profitability. Like profitability is, it's, it's cool, right? Mm -hmm. It's profitability is cooler than going out and chasing other people's money. I, I know that that's, 
sounds, however, it sounds like some capitalistic whatever, but guess what? This is a capitalistic system. And like, I believe in that system. I, I'm not gonna, I don't worship money, but you have to have businesses that make money. Like at some point, someone has to do the hard work. You have to build things and you have to sell things that provide value to people. That's kind of the deal. It can be a service. It can be a thing, but all this funny money stuff going around all over the place, uh, you know, at some point, someone, someone wants their money back and, and it's not a bad, sorry, that's not a good place to be on the end of a phone call. Was there a moment for you that you can remember where you, where GORUCK got to a point where you knew you didn't have to worry about money anymore? Like, do, do you remember that moment where you're like, you know what? Uh, we've got our head above the cloud. You know, we're above water. We're, we're not going to fall back below. I have got the security from this company uh, and the stability that I need. Like, the, the, was there a specific moment that that happened for you? Well, I never thought about it like that. It, it's never been a, a money thing for me. It's more been a, I didn't want the brand of GORUCK to die or what GORUCK represented. And it took me a long time to figure out that you have to have a sustainable business for the brand to not die, right? Like you can't have a brand. It doesn't work, right? You know, you and your Instagram account being cool and stuff, is, it's not enough. I mean, someone has to actually, you have to actually build a business. And the fundamentals of business are, you know, supply, demand, price, all that kind of stuff, right? And 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 so... There, there was never a moment where I'm like, oh, we've, we've made it. Like, it, like to say that kind of makes me feel dirty, right? Because I think we just have so much more to give back in, in terms of, like, we want people to be active. We want people, we want communities to be stronger. We, we want people to be empowered, right? And that work is just never done. To me, it's just God's work. It's like the mission of the Green Berets is never going to be over. You know, and so that it's fun to be a part of something like that, though, when it's never over and you wake up and you have mission and purpose and and it feels really good. So, um, you know, I mean, like, frankly, there's still a huge part of me that wishes I was, like had gone through the original plan. Right. I'm in the I'm in the ground ground branch or whatever at the agency and I'm working out of an embassy and. You know, doing God's work for America somewhere else. You know, you don't get to live two lives though. And, and I very much am committed to Go Rock and to to the mission that that we have and and to what we're we're able to do. And so that's I had to make peace with the fact that that was my calling. You wrote a book, and it's uh, aptly titled "How Not to Start a Backpack Company." But it's about a lot more uh, than what, you know, the title would indicate. So kind of enlighten me to why you wrote the book and uh, what it touches on. And it seems very personal in nature. Yeah, I mean, I there's just so much stuff out there. And everyone wants to write a self-help book. And everyone wants to give you the three-step process. And everyone wants to tell you, you know, buy this and, you know, buy this and everything's going to be fine. And, and that's just not how the world works that at least the life that I've led. And, and so I'm, I'm attracted to, to people's stories that are kind of real and honest. And this is what it was like for me. And I think that there's a lot that binds us together as, as humans that we, we gloss over too often in, in favor of the, the sort of veneer that people put up like everything's great all the time and, and I've got my stuff together and you need to get your stuff together too. And one, two, three, bada bing, bada boom, buy this and it's going to be perfect. And and so, you know, I, I kept a journal in the summer of 2010 and life was pretty, pretty not great. And I was driving around through all 48 states with my dog for, for most of it and had a couple of people with me and, and trying to figure out how to build a business in America and it just, it, it was a colossal failure. 
But America was really beautiful. And I met a lot of really great people. And it, it certainly was an adventure. And it kind of let me escape whatever, well, the lot of things that I was trying to escape at that time. So in that regard, it, it was successful. And I didn't have to go work at a bank for some type of internship between my two years of business school. And, and I was grateful for that. And I, I just thought that, look, we didn't make a big deal about this this book. It, it wasn't kind of a, a huge, you know, we self-published it and, you know, sold thousands of copies. What, like, but, but not, like, we're not, we're not, like, doing huge book tours and everything. It's, it's mostly just like, look, this is my story. This is, this is how it was in the early days. And for those people who are at our company or those people who are in the community, sometimes you have to remember your roots and, and the roots were, this whole thing was pretty precarious, right? It, it was, it was not just preordained to, to succeed. Not like, the the it's not like the universe just conspired and said, man, I just really need this. The world just needs a backpack company right now. You know, it's not how it worked at all. And so I, th- there's just some some value I think in because we talked about this earlier. A lot of people's paths are are difficult, and portraying some of the difficulties as as honestly as possible. And in this case, it's a private journal that I kept in the summer of 2010. Right. It's personal. (laughs) And, and, uh, you know, it's like, look, lots of people struggle in, in big ways, but you can get through this. And, and that's kind of where that's, that's where I am. You know, Uh, I went and was, was really proud to to have served, but I want to only have been a green beret for the rest of my life. I have a lot more to give back, you know, and and I don't want to only have started Go Ruck or only have just done one backpack. And like, there, there's always more to do. There's more. You got to kind of reinvent yourself as you, as you move forward. And and so look, this was this was something that I I worked together with uh, one of the photographers or the photographer who was with me that summer. And he took a lot of beautiful photos, and I took a lot of photos of my dogs. <laughs> And we, we, uh, synced up in like January of this year and then the, the, the pandemic happened, COVID. And so we just kind of worked on it remotely for in, in the early days of the, the pandemic and, and eventually released it. And, you know, the people that, the people that found it and read it at a minimum, they're like, all right, th- this was real, you know, and, and that's, that's what we were going for. Right. Because, you know, one day my kids will read it. You know, the people that work at Go Ruck will read it. The community has read it. And, and it's kind of an honest look on what it, what it feels like in the room when you're, when you're starting a company. Not the one, two, three, four, this is how to set up a bank account. If you need someone to tell you how to set up a bank account, don't, don't go become an entrepreneur, right? But this is just more, this is how miserable it was for me. And this is what Murphy striking looks like. And, and so... You know, for you, it might be something else, but it's going to be kind of like this. To that end, when I say Go Ruck, $100 million company, what's the first thing that pops in your mind? Uh, um, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of cold to that. I, I, I write it and, and I, I, I talk about these, these numbers because if, if you don't, then people assume they just don't know. And so they think that, you know, oh, it's it's a hundred times bigger. It's it's a fraction of the size. Who knows? I just, you know, that stuff just doesn't motivate me. Uh, I mean, I I want us to grow, and I want us to, I want more people to to live the special forces way of life, which is what we're based on. So, you know, the company needs to grow as well, and and growth is certainly fun, but you know. You could say a billion dollar company and I'll have the same reaction. All right, so, so let, like, me, let me rephrase cool, it then. Like, cool, let's do it. Let me rephrase it then. How does the company Go Ruck define success? Yeah, so it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a striking balance between kind of the, the, the business goals, so to say, but, but it really comes down to the people, right? I mean, and when I say that, I mean, 
we have 450 rock clubs throughout the country, right? So community led rock clubs, they get together at, on the days, weeks, afternoons of, of their choosing and they bring people together and they work out and then maybe they talk about their lives. Maybe they drink some beer. Maybe they go to dinner. I don't know. It's up to them, right? That's, that's what the deal is. And when you start to say, how do we grow that? Because so much of the world is focused on living an experience online. And how many followers do you have here? And how many quote friends do you have? And look, those things are fine. Social media is a tool. Your phone is a, is a tool. It's like a computer in your pocket. It's awesome, right? You, use it wisely. It's like the end of Indiana Jones, you know? You have chosen poorly. You have chosen wisely, <laughs> right? Choose, choose wisely. Don't, don't spend all of your days scrolling through someone else's feed. So when I think about what does, what does success look like, there's not, there's not a huge measurement. I and mean, I'm sure there's, you have to attach some business metrics to it. But what I see is a world where you know, rocking is a really big thing. And people are out doing it together in parks and on sidewalks and on trails. And, you know, they're, they're meeting in their, their driveways and in their garages and they're tossing sandbags around and they're talking about their lives. And then they're going out for a walk and they're talking to each other in the real world. And, you know, I see a world where a world where rucking is bigger than, than jogging or running. And, I can list you a million reasons why that should happen. We just have a lot of work to get there before it does. And so that's kind of what, that's kind of the Northern star for, for me is strengthen the community, empower the in, in individuals to, to lead more active lives and to strengthen the communities around them and, and build a business around that. I mean, that's awesome. I, you know, I, I, it's inspiring to hear you say it, and I'm, and I'm not just blowing smoke. I, I, I get a smile on my face hearing you talk about it because there really is a, um, there, there's a greater sense. I mean, I, listen, I respect the business acumen, right, and I, and I respect what it takes just to be able to build a one hundred million dollar company because it's not easy. Because if it was, then everybody would have a hundred million dollars, and they don't. So from that standpoint, those metrics have value, but that doesn't mean that it has to define your worth if that makes sense. Um, and, and so when I hear you talk about the idea of rucking and go ruck and what it means and the community that it builds and everything else, um, you know, the value on that and the worth of that, uh, I would assume in your mind exceeds any dollar value that the company is actually worth. Yeah. I mean, I'm just not, I'm just not, it's at some point really deep inside of me. It's, it's kind of, I will always owe, right? I'm still alive. I'm a better person because I went to war. I'm vertical, not horizontal. You know, the, the things that it's sort of like military humor, it's either slapstick or really dark, right? <laughs> really dark. Yeah. And, and so when you start like, I don't want to drift too far in, in either direction because I suck at slapstick and, and the dark stuff is, is, is not usually the best place to go. But like, look, I mean, you sort of smile when you say, look, I'm, I'm vertical, not horizontal. And it's like, you know, it, it could be so much worse. And, and I got buddies that aren't here anymore. And, you know, I've, I've been through a lot and I'm, I'm really just, I'm really just happy. And, and I'm happy to be able to give back and I'm happy to be able to, to lead a life in America and to have a family and, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep giving until I got no more breath left in me. And so you, you take away some zeros, you add some zeros. It's cool. But I, there's a certain way of life and a commitment to excellence that I, 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 I've kind of always had it inside of me, but the accountability that special forces provided me is something that remains a Northern star, right? Like I don't, I don't want to be, the, the guy in the regiment that people are ashamed that I was in the regiment. And it's, it's that same sort of fear of letting someone down or not meeting the standard in the, in training or in war or whatever. And, and so 
you know, that's kind of, uh, it, it's a hugely motivating factor for me. And, and, and frankly, when you become blinded by or too motivated by money or, or the things that that entails, it's just, I mean, I think you, I think you trade too much of your life for it. And, and that said, like, look, I, I like to win and I want us to be really successful because I want to change a lot of lives. So there's, there's always kind of forces that are at odds and, and yet add a zero, take away a zero. Like, my life's not going to change. Uh, I'm still going to be fighting, fighting for the causes and, and the fights that I believe in. And, and like, I know what enough looks like. I know what it feels like because I have enough. I have more than enough right now. And so I just want to keep on fighting a good fight. Well, I encourage everybody to go to GoRuck.com and just search for events that are local in your area. Um, there's plenty. They're easy to find. It's, the website's very user-friendly from that standpoint. And, and take part in this whole thing because uh, it, it really is uh, the, the challenge is there, the mental, the physical challenge is there. And uh, you, you talk about those rewards that you get on the other end uh, from, from somebody who's done a little bit of rucking in his military career. There is a, there is a ton of reward in getting to the finish line of these things. So... Uh, I, I recommend that you guys go do that. Any other sort of uh, pieces of advice or, or, you know, do you want them to go to GoRock.com and, and look for stuff there? I mean, kind of tell people where they can get familiar with the products if they're not. Yeah, so um, we just actually separated out all the events. The events are on uh, from a technology platform. The events are at GoRockEvents.com and the merchandising stuff is at GoRock.com. And we're on all the social channels. I mean, Instagram, Facebook, all, all that all that jazz, um, you know, I mean, look, my take is that we believe in personal responsibility and we want people to, you, you got to take the first step somewhere. So if you're looking for somewhere, you, you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself. It doesn't have to be go rock. Right? It doesn't have to be the, the, it doesn't have to be whatever you don't want it to be but you need to join something, right? So go be more active, right? Get off your phone. Hopefully you're outside right now with a rock on staring up at blue skies, wherever you are. And you know, you've got good sweat kicking and, and you're like motivated and inspired. And that would be awesome right now. Call a buddy up and say, Hey, want to go do this thing. And look, that's the way of life that we promote. So, you know, that, that's what our, that's what our people, that's what our community is about. And, and if you want to join us, then then come get in fight. Perfectly said, Jason. Again, uh, I'm I'm kind of in awe of all this. Just learning more about the company and how you built it, and uh, your personal story. Again, the book is called "How Not to Build a Backpack Company." Uh, if you guys want to pick it up and read it, and uh, certainly uh, continued success uh, from a business standpoint. But uh, your other goals, your other aspirations for what you're hoping to create in the GoRuck community. Uh, more success there because uh, you've certainly built something that that we all can get behind. So again, thank you for being here, man. Thank you for sharing your story and thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thanks, man. I appreciate your time. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground podcast hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.